Welcome to Module 9. In this module, we focused only on Hegel, because he's something of a founder of contemporary philosophical movements, but also because his work is ridiculously complex. In this video, we'll cover a few additional points that bear noting, especially for later modules. I should also note, all the following modules deal with the fallout of Hegel's work, whether directly or indirectly, and so you should pay extra attention to this chapter so you don't get lost later. First thing we should mention is that Hegel's work comes as a response to the Enlightenment, which started around 1700. Enlightenment was a continuation of the Renaissance, but with the additional features like getting rid of a lot of religious elements, partially through the Protestant Reformation. As a result, we see, as was noted in the previous module, that a lot of the focus shifted towards ideas of pure reason and away from the kinds of metaphysical notions that were championed by religion. Enlightenment gave rise to the Romantic movement as its opposite, which thought that the pure reason and materialism was insufficient for human thriving, and so set itself against the Enlightenment focus. Of course, Enlightenment had broken the idea of a human being. To the Enlightenment thinkers, only reason mattered, but a human being was not pure reason, so the Romantics sought to find a way to recreate the ancient cultural and religious ideas which had managed to understand humanity as a holistic combination of material, that would be body, and immaterial, rational, elements. While the Enlightenment thinkers focused on reason, that led them to a bit of a problem. The very nature of reason became something that we could not understand, because reason was the way we understood everything else. Think of it this way. You can use a microscope to understand a lot of things, but you can't use the microscope to examine the microscope, because that microscope is the tool that you are using to understand other things. Same with reason. This is closely related to the point made by El Ghazali about our inability to use reason to defend reason. Hegel argues that the way forward is by understanding the world, reason included, as a process of development. The issue, as far as he can tell, is that the Enlightenment thinkers try to understand the world and reason as a static object, a thing that does not change. If reason is the kind of thing that does not change, then it is not the kind of thing that you can readily observe. But if it does change, then you can derive some kind of meaning through that change itself. Here is a poor analogy. Imagine you know that there is an animal in the forest in front of you, but you can't see it. If that animal stays still, you can't know anything about it. But if it starts to move, if it changes position or anything like that, then you can observe those changes and figure something out. When it moves, is it a big animal noise or a small animal noise? Is it in the air or on the ground? Does it squeak, roar, hiss, or screech? All these changes tell you something about the animal, and so you can understand it without seeing it directly. This idea of development is a kind of new teleology. It tells us about how things should be, and also how things have progressed, are progressing, and will progress, and what the end goal of all that progress is. This is why change is a big deal in Hegel. Change signifies that the initial position was not perfect because the object was not done moving. The place where the thing stops, when it will no longer move, that's the final or perfect stage. When the change is geared towards achieving some goal, then we characterize it as progress, which means to move towards something, which is the way that Hegel sees everything. It's all headed towards a goal. For Hegel, consciousness is not merely a static state of the mind, spirit, or consciousness. That consciousness is a self-propagating, self-progressing phenomenon, which is undergoing changes. These changes mark the progress of consciousness. The method of this progress is through a series of shifts and changes. Each of the shifts is a wrong move, but they are necessary and add up to the movement in the right direction toward the final goal. You can think of this as a perpetually self-correcting way of moving forward. The way works something like this. You pick a direction of movement and start heading that way towards what you think is the goal. But, as you move, you realize that your goal was not where you were hoping for, 
so you correct in the new direction which you now think is the goal. But as you move again, you recognize that this new goal is not quite right either, and so you correct, and so on and so on. You make the adjustment because each move is not good enough for what you wanted, and so you keep correcting your course. Notice, by the way, that even with all the corrections, you are getting closer to the goal. The zigzag pattern is formed according to a repeating pattern in thought, which Hegel labels thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. This is something like you try an idea, don't get all of what you wanted, so you try the reverse of the idea and still don't get everything you wanted. So you try combining the two ideas and it works better than either one individually. This then becomes a new idea from which you will develop the reverse and then combine and so forth. For example, you decide that being happy is the most important thing. So you have no job and only have fun. But then bills come due and you see that the all fun and no work approach does not work. And so you shift into just having a job. Now you have work and no fun and you don't like that either because what are you working for? And then you decide to combine the two approaches. You have a job but also leave some free time. Goldilocks style. This pattern emerges for Hegel from experience that the consciousness undergoes with each step ultimately being an unsatisfactory solution to the problem, which then gives rise to the next step, and so on. Another recurring theme, which is part of the development pattern, is that we can only go on to the next step because something knocks us out of our immediate experience. This is always a feature of the failure of an idea to fully deliver. Something has to go wrong. This forces us to step back and look at ourselves, our ideas, and our world in a new way. The key point is that, without the discomfort of failure, we get complacent and stuck in our habitual thinking. But that thinking is wrong, so we need to be shaken up in order to move. For a fish, water is imminent as an environment. But take the fish out of water, and suddenly it becomes aware that the world is not just simply water. Hegel gives us an example of how we come to be self-conscious, that is, to recognize ourselves as ourselves. This process is a painful one and can only happen when we are faced with another consciousness. According to Hegel, this experience works something like this. When we encounter another consciousness, we become aware that we see them as just another object in the world, and we see objects as things that we use and subjugate for our use. The moment we recognize that, we become aware that the other consciousness is perceiving us the same way. That is, from their perspective, we are just a thing for them to use and subjugate. And now we have the struggle. I want to be myself, but you want to make me into something you use and subjugate, and vice versa. This struggle demonstrates the failure of the kind of simple and imminent thinking of myself as the center of the world. Now I am aware of myself in an objectified sense. Now I can think about myself as a thing, and that means that now I can think about thinking and what it means to think about thinking. Before, I was merely thinking. Let's look at a few examples. When you're driving your car down the road and everything is going well, the car is a kind of extension of your will. It does what you want. This leads you to mistakenly believe that you are in control of the vehicle. But as soon as something starts making that funny sound, or the steering goes bad, or any of the million things that do go wrong, suddenly you realize that your control of the vehicle was mostly an illusion. And then the car becomes something strange and alien to you, because it is no longer an extension of your will. It opposes your will. It is no longer imminent. It is objectified. There is a short poem called The Centipede's Dilemma. It goes like this. A centipede was happy, quiet, until a toad in fun said, Pray, which leg moves after which? This raised her doubts to such a pitch, she fell exhausted in the ditch, not knowing how to run. The point is, as soon as the immediate experience goes awry, we are knocked out of the moment, and suddenly confronted by the fact that 
what we took for granted is now a puzzle we have to solve. That moment is what makes the progress of consciousness possible. Hegel gives us another interesting point to counter enlightenment thinkers. All the cold calculating reason in the world does not tell you what to do. Oh, it gives you the options of what you can do, but it can't make a choice. Something else does that. This is, for Hegel, an unacceptable conclusion. If you think back to our idea of metaphysical hierarchies and the greatest moral value, the thing that acts as God and takes the place of your GHE, you'll recall that this is the thing that gives you value. But you will also recall that we noted that the selection of the GHE was something that was taken as an assumption. Reason does not get you that, it only explains how we act to make sense of that top entity. The reason this is unacceptable to Hegel is because getting your GHE from desires is incoherent. It is arbitrary, and that undermines the complete notion of morality and ethics. It is arbitrary because you have no control over your emotions, in the sense that you can make yourself feel that you love a thing you hate, or hate a thing you love. Emotion is more like something that happens to you, not something that you participate in. For Hegel, reason must determine the kinds of actions we take. In case you're thinking that desire and action are separate things, they are. But for Hegel, they are supposed to eventually come together so that all action and emotion is in line with reason. You do the thing you want because it is the rational thing to do, and you desire it because it is rational. Hegel explains this in the part on morality. He says, rationality is universal, that is, it is not an artifact, and rational ideas are rational at every time, in every place, and for all people. Our direction, aims, goals, and decisions are rational, because we are not random action generators, and we can evaluate our ideas on the basis of reason. That means that our direction, aims, goals, and decisions are universal. This is because they are rational and rationality is universal. Now this does not mean that my decision or your direction is rational or universal, but that it can and should be, or rather that it will be. Direction, aims, and goals are the basis for ethics and therefore the basis for ethics is rational and universal. Now the fact that we have not yet gotten to rational ethics is merely a matter of our current state of development. Hegel thinks that because of the telos of humanity, our arrival at such a point is inevitable, which leads us to the last part, history and progress. Hegel's view of history is unique. He argues that because progress is a self-regulating and self-driving process, there is no way of not getting to the end point. The progress of humanity is inevitable, like gravity. All of history is merely a demonstration of that process of progress. That means all the good and the bad, all the horror and tragedy, it is all a necessary part of getting the consciousness to develop in a way that forces the next stage and the next until we reach the final goal of perfection. This means that we are all, ultimately, merely pawns on the board of history controlled by progress. This also means that, for Hegel, the world is always exactly as it should be. To clarify, the Holocaust is things being exactly as they should be, because that knocked us out of our complacency and force us to reevaluate functional government and the way we interact. That was the only way. It was necessary for the betterment of humanity. Dark, I know, but that's Hegel's position. Granted, Hegel died about 110 years before the Holocaust, so he could not have imagined it, but there is no reason to believe that he would think of it any differently. History, for Hegel, is a story that is already written we are merely playing it out. All that matters for Hegel is progress and that progress is always actually aimed at freedom.
That freedom, by the way, is always only attainable through the state in which one participates. The state is one that is based on reason and rational, universal, impartial laws that every rational individual can freely and rationally consent to. The state is critical because human beings are social creatures. We require a certain kind of functional society if we're going to survive and thrive. Therefore, the state is paramount as the mechanism by which we are socialized and integrated into humanity. Therefore, all human values exist only through the state, for Hegel. And the state, therefore, is a representation of the divine idea as it exists on Earth. This complex system Hegel lays out will have a massive influence on Marx and by extension on Nietzsche and then on the postmodernists, which is the primary group that philosophy and the world is contending with today. You should already have a sense of just how deeply historical ideas like religion are embedded in our modern understanding of the world. But now, you will see just how deeply philosophical ideas are embedded in your everyday experiences, problems, solutions, and the way that we understand the world around us.